Good morning and welcome. All right, Marissa, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Lynn. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, I am Marissa Kaiko. I'm the Digital Collections Librarian at SUNY Oswego's Penfield Library. My pronouns are she, her. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what library anxiety is like in our digital world. Um, so I will cover today what library anxiety is and why it's important for everyone, I think, in higher ed to understand, not just librarians, um, how the digital experience of library resources adds an extra layer to library anxiety. And then I'll share a few ideas about how we might be able to better support and prepare students to um, use the library in a digital context. I'll also, I'm gonna try to leave a good couple minutes at the end for any questions. And I definitely encourage comments as well. This is some, kind of something that's like developing that I've started thinking about. So I'd love to hear about how you all, I think our audience today might come from different areas of education. So I would love to know how you see this um, with your students. So let's get started. Um, what is library anxiety? So. What is the concept? What's the background? How does this persist in the library space? And how does it continue to be observed today? So it starts with Constance Mellon's Library Anxiety, A Grounded Theory and Its Development, um, which was originally published in College and Research Libraries in March 1986. Um, Mellon studied the collected diary style writings from undergraduate students in various English composition courses over about a two year period that were about their experience using the library for research. So Mellon's study was interesting. It was really interdisciplinary. She, what she did was link the idea of personal documents from qualitative research to personal writing from writing across the curriculum. And she applied theories of test and math anxiety to her research and also borrowed this method of grounded theory from sociology. Um, and a lot has been written about her methods and her use of grounded theory. And I think part of the reason her concept has endured for so long is because partially because of her methods. I think she really saw the importance of hearing firsthand experiences of students to uncover this construct. So through her study, Mellon found that 75 to 85% of students used a language of fear to describe their feelings about using the library for research assignments, which is kind of like an unbelievable figure. Um, so in Mellon's, in Mellon's words, she said that when students were confronted with the need to gather information in the library for their first research paper, Many students become so anxious that they are unable to approach the pro problem logically or effectively. Um, she called this overarching fear and discomfort directed at using the library, library anxiety. So the indicators of library anxiety that she identified were the assumption that others know how to use the library better or more efficiently and like their skills are adequate and my skills are not adequate. Um, and this would bring about feelings of shame about the lack of knowledge about the library. Um, then with that, there's also the feeling that if you ask for help, um, your lack of knowledge will be revealed and that you know causes a doubling down on that shame or embarrassment. Um, Mellon's theory about library anxiety pointed out that there are elements of the library that are causing students to feel, you know, alienated and uncomfortable and overwhelmed. And this is being experienced by a really large portion of students, which prompts more questions about, you know, what those elements might be and deeper questions about how library anxiety is felt and who is experiencing it. Um, yeah. 
So with all of those questions that this brings up, library anxiety has proven to be an enduring concept um, in library and information science. And it really a huge body of work has built been built upon it. Um, and these bodies of work include investigations into how library anxiety is experienced by different user groups, undergraduate students, minority students, graduate students, are they experiencing it in different ways? Um, some of these get really granular. Like I think one of the articles that I have cited here is looks only at nursing students. So people have looked at this in all different ways because these user groups all have a different way they go about searching for information and different information needs. So then there's also work about how library design might contribute to library anxiety. What is the physical space like, the psychological state, and feelings that accompany library anxiety, and then the development of instruments to measure library anxiety. So when we see that these things might be uh, being experienced by our students, how do we actually measure that? Um, and then also the differentiating of library anxiety from things like research anxiety or information anxiety. Is it different? How is it different? So one observation that stood out to me after looking at a lot of this literature is that library anxiety as a concept is focused on the physical environment of the library, um, which makes sense considering that Mellon's paper was published in 1986. And we're thinking like Lynn, I don't know if you mentioned that before the session started, but yeah, card catalogs, searching and browsing and stacks that, you know, they're seemingly endless. Um, in some of these big academic libraries, there could be, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of books and navigating a space that is big and stores that many volumes could be overwhelming. So um, also something to consider in the physical library is that users are possibly being observed or feel that they're being observed by others, by their peers, as they attempt to find what they're looking for. They might have to approach a librarian face to face, which is scary. Um, <laughs> uh, they might not know exactly what libraries librarians do or what librarians can help them with. Um, they might feel they're, oh, I'm interrupting the librarian. I don't want to do that. Um, I don't want to ask them for help. Or, you know, they might be resigning to old stereotypes of mean librarians who shush you or judge you for not understanding the ways of the library. So I think another factor that might cause users unease is having the understanding of you know library etiquette and rules regarding you know sound levels in different spaces you know where can i have water where can i have food and other like usage pol policies about that and not knowing oh can i do this here maybe i don't want to go here at all so i think everyone can acknowledge that the physical environment of the library has definitely changed significantly and is continuing to change. So that's not just in terms of space design systems, but also in atmosphere and mission, you know, as we work toward being more and more inclusive. So um, let's talk about what I think might be the most significant change to library service since Mellon's paper, which is the computer. So, how is the library different, you know, in a digital context? Because it's definitely, they're existing in a digital context. Um, if we know that users are overwhelmed and anxious and uncomfortable about being in the physical space of a library, um, a library that is digital might affect users in a totally different way. Um, first, I would say that users um, need even more skills to effectively use the library in a digital context. Um, so this includes not only information literacy, which we're probably familiar with, but describes the ability to find, evaluate, organize, use, and communicate information in multiple formats. And there's a lot of decision-making and problem-solving and coping with nuance and subtlety and bias all involved in that. And then digital literacy, which sometimes is lumped in with information literacy, sometimes it's talked about as a separate 
phenomenon, um, digital literacy, which describes the basic ability to use a computer effectively. So it's not only these two literacies, but also having a rough idea of how the library has organized its information online that is specific to the library. So I'm putting this separately from an overarching information literacy because it is different library to library. You know, just because students have used library resources before, maybe in high school, maybe at a college they previously attended, um, library web pages and catalogs might be quite different despite serving the same general purposes. Um, and there's a learning curve in and of itself. So browsing is different digitally and library catalog technologies do this to varying, varying degrees of success. Um, although a search box might have a familiar appearance, searching library catalogs and databases is very different. Um, and to understand the organization of the digital library requires the knowledge of the physical library like as a baseline. Um, so that might bring up some of the defining char characteristics of library anxiety in its original physical sense. Um, so how does that change library anxiety? Um, whether users have questions about when and what they can access at the library, um, whether they are searching for information in the library's catalog or databases, or they're interacting with the digitized versions of physical archival or special collections materials, um, like library resources, they take many forms. Um, the user's interaction with the library, it almost always involves an interaction with the computer. Um, so whether the user themselves consults a computer for information, and that's remotely or in the library, or a librarian does it for them. Um, all the information beyond like formal library procedures and expectations are available through a computer. Um, and you know, current forces like increased distance learning, where you know some students who are fully remote may never take a single step into the physical library of their university. Um, there and the um, expectation that students come to us with some level of digital literacy make it more likely that library interactions and resources will in some way be mediated by a computer. But my question is, how do users really feel about computers? Um, I think we might assume that the computer would mitigate some of the user's possible discomfort with the library. I think it gives the users the ability to ask questions via chat, you know, type a search term into a convenient search box, and um, the ability to access resources from a familiar or convenient space, you know, at your leisure, on your couch. Um, they can do so without feeling that they're being observed, um, which might be comforting, you know, make as many mistakes as you need to. There's no one looking at you. Um, you, um, what else do I want to say about this? Um, I don't know. I, I just think that might be more comforting. Something about the familiarity of the computer and of the space where you're using it, it those things are removed with the digital library. So, but I think in, in reality, a computer mediated library experience, it presents its own separate challenges to users. So that would include the fact that much like libraries, computers can also be a source of discomfort for users. Um, they might have had the belief that, you know, yes, I know how to use a computer. I use one every day. But the way that library systems and research assignments ask them to use a computer is obviously very different from their typical computer use um, experience scenarios, which they could find surprising, you know, maybe even discouraging, like having that feeling like, oh, I know how to do this. And then wait a second, no, I don't know how to do this. I'm not getting results that I thought I would get. Um, I'm getting millions of results. I'm getting three results. Like, why doesn't it understand what I want? Why isn't it, why can't I type the question in like, like Google? Um, so 
like library anxiety, computer anxiety is something that's also been widely studied. Um, scales have been developed to measure computer attitudes and computer anxiety has been differentiated from research anxiety, information anxiety, and technophobia. Um, if, users, if users are experiencing shame around their lack of knowledge about the library, you know, like what is there to say about the amount of shame a user might experience surrounding a lack of knowledge around using a computer, um, which might be something we take for granted. Um, my guess is that this might even be more stressful and anxiety producing to users um, due to what has become, you know, a social and academic expectation of digital literacy. So the big question here really is how do we, how do we describe the experience of our users when the feelings of anxiety are both, are around both libraries and computers, you know, those two are combined. Um, if the characteristics of library anxiety are still present and they're being expressed through common challenges like the in inability to formulate a search, which is a skill that takes time to develop, um, trouble navigating library specific language, information overload, you know, realizing the amount of information available um, and becoming overwhelmed by how much there is or being, like I said before, discouraged by inefficient information available or as a result of, you know, an inefficient search or inefficient library resources could also be the issue there. Um, and also the difficulty asking for help when you come across these questions. So the digital experience of the library has its own set of characteristics that I think might extend or exacerbate these issues, um, like the organization of di digital content um, and just generally decentralized content of the library. You know, understanding that the library catalog might be different from digital collections and digital collections and content might be you know, the product of another organization or hosted elsewhere. And all of these things come together on a web page that has so many things to click on. So the design has to be super, super intentional. Um, but maybe that's not always the case. There could be design that is not accessible. Um, then there's also the enormous amount of information that is available, which is hard to rationalize. And because users can't see how much information there is like in the physical library. It might be discouraging to know that it's there and not actually be able to search it in a way that provides satisfactory results. Um, also, the digital library requires understanding access. Why can't I get to this article? Am I logged in the right way? X, Y, Z, I might have to ask for help. Um, and then I think uh, not to be, again, taken for granted is also the inequitable access to, you know, a stable internet connection, just because um, you can use the library from the comfort of your own home doesn't mean you necessarily have the um, stable inter internet connection needed to do the browsing and everything that you need to do. So how can we help? So I have some suggestions here just by really off, off looking at the, I, I think, small amount of literature that I've looked at, but, um, but yeah, in no way is exhaustive. But I think a lot of what we can do is remembering to meet people, you know, where they're at, recognizing there is a learning curve. I think even, I think even us and me, myself as a librarian, um, when you come to a new institution, you do have to be intentional about taking time to look at your library's website and learn where things are and learn where a catalog is. And, you know, every time a student comes to a new educational setting, they need time to adjust to new systems. Um, one library site could be vastly different from another, and it can be, you know, intimidating to dive into that. Um, there's also updates and changes being made almost constantly, and these are among all of the other challenges that students deal with and really only make up a portion of the systems students need to be familiar with 
to navigate higher ed as well. You know, they're, they might be paying bills online. They might be, excuse me, they might be um, dealing with financial aid systems. They have their course management system that they need to learn, but also then they need to learn, um, you know, the systems that the library has in the databases that are relevant to the work that they're going to be doing. So a lot of that comes in all at the same time. And maybe you're using it a lot at one time for one assignment, but then you move away from it and don't come back to it again. So really either keeping it constant or keeping it that there's like built in time to say, okay, either we're going to the library for a session or we're going to take, you know, 10 minutes out of class to make sure everybody is on the same page and we're taking like you know a set time to just explore the website period could be something that is helpful. So I think something else that might be helpful is to just like encourage students, yeah, to play around with library resources and digital resources in, in general. So um also with this to like, just acknowledge different experience level with libraries in general. Um, as well as research and computer skills too. Um, and then I think the most important is just to stress that not knowing is okay. Um, I think that sometimes uh, creating more information is also not the answer. Um, just creating more links and more resources and more places to go um, that maybe are going to at some point be abandoned or not updated or turn into just like this dead link. Um, we should definitely work to make our information about library use and the design of our website and resources are easy to use. They're user centered and as accessible as possible. Um, but at the end of the day, I think a lot can be said for creating a welcoming physical environment and presenting a positive, encouraging environment, um, attempting to create, you know, attempting to create comfort with not knowing and coping mechanisms for like these stressors. I think like information literacy is something of obviously that students are working on from when they start, when they start as freshmen until they graduate, and then we'll continue to build throughout their life, it's an ongoing process. So there shouldn't be, you know, this pressure that, oh, I need to know this. Like you're always gonna come across problems that you don't know the answer to. And I think like recognizing those mo moments and uh, highlighting them and being like, okay, um, this, this is what happens. This is how research is. This is how um, a lot of things work. Um, but it's a, it's a, and having them understand that it's a really big ask. Like there's no time where this is going to be perfect. Um, you know, you could spend all day creating guides and how to's and documents and videos and more and more resources um, to try to like answer questions for students, but user like they might not ever read these things. You know, how can we make it easier for them to ask for help? And I think that is just normalizing the fact that there is a lot of nuance and subtlety that goes into these things and not knowing exactly how a system works is okay. And it's, in many cases, it's probably not you, it's probably the system. So to be also critical of the systems that they're using is part of that information literacy as well. Um, so that is about what I have today. I'd love if there were any questions or definitely comments too. Um, I'd love to know how you've experienced this with students. Um, yeah, and feel free to email me or contact me about this in the future. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. Um, I do have references here at the end if you're curious about any of that. Yes, thank you. Wow, well, thank you, Marissa. That was great. Um, I guess I have, uh, what one comment and one different kind of anxiety. <laughs> so the, the comment is just that um, a couple of years ago um, in a, a Victorian literature course, I was teaching 
I had my students um, do the um, uh, stacked modules that the Modern Language Association has created um, for how to use the MLA database to do searches. And so that's, you know, that's just teaching them to use one tool. But I think a lot of what you learn by using that one tool is probably transferable to um, doing library database searches, which is, as you point out, so different from just doing a search in, in Google um, and as a specialized skill. So, and I was really, so, you know, students completed the modules, they earned a badge, they got credit in my class, but they also got an independent badge that they could display if they wanted, say, in a LinkedIn profile. Um, and um, they told me they got a lot out of it. And so, I, you know, building it into a class in that way, I think is, was really helpful for them and, and helpful for me, because in the class I'm teaching this semester, when I asked students to talk about the difference between the results you get from searching for information in Google and what you might get from searching a library database, they didn't really have much to say. So, so that was one comment I wanted to make, and just the anxiety, which maybe some other folks share as well, is that um, we may soon find that students don't even have the kind of facility navigating um, search engine results that, as minimal as those may be, because most people, as you know, don't look past, say, the first screen of results, but... Um, if instead of getting a screen of results, you you just ask a chat bot for an answer to your question, you know, it's it's totally curated by by an algorithm um, rather than um, giving you a wealth of information that you have to sort through. So that's the comment. Great. Thank you. I don't know what to do with that anxiety, but there it is. Totally. Yeah. yeah, I think what what you said is really great because I think if there's a way to build it into assignments and kind of like incentivize looking at it closer, I think students really respond to that better than just, okay, go for it. See, see what happens, you know, so. Yeah, and I see a great comment in the chat here from oh. Lisa Berardino that, um, you know, an assignment that you can give to compare chat GPT material to a library database search right yes totally i i love that well, yes, what's but... your what are your thoughts about embedded librarians in the online courses because that is such a i feel that that could be a really effective approach but i know that librarians can't be everywhere and you're already stretched <laughs> so thin but that that uh, experience for students is great because they do tend to like go to the search engines and go to chat GPT. And I just did a presentation on AI, but I really, you know, I really recognize the great value of libraries and really good research. Uh, so what do you think about that? Totally. I think that's a great idea. Or even if it's just the library, the same librarian reappears multiple times online, um, I think, you know, we're we're willing to appear online through Zoom. So, and work with students th through the databases that way, especially when you're not coming into the, the physical library, it's hard, I think, to like know a specific, you know, like who am I gonna go to to ask for help? There's on, on the website, there's multiple librarians. So I think having like a specific librarian be embedded in a course like, or your subject librarian, to be like that person that like, oh, that's the librarian that I know of. If that librarian is different, maybe they'll, you know, tap someone else to help you, but that maybe that's the one person that you are familiar with and there's a face to this person to go to. I think, yeah, for online classes, I think that's a huge, a huge opportunity just for students to get you know, a face to the library. Yeah. Yeah, in the chat, a lot of people seem to like the embedded librarian idea. Um, and and uh, 
just the, it's the idea of library anxiety clearly resonating with people. Great. Yeah. This is, this is, this is, I, I love your point about the, um, the fact that I, I, just to generalize from your point about libraries, there's so many ways in which our ability to navigate digital spaces is built on the understanding we already have of physical objects and physical spaces. And as those go away, you know, as more and more students are familiar with books themselves and, and newspapers only through digital interfaces, um, it becomes harder to have that physical reference point and totally. create some new challenges for people to, to be oriented in, in new digital spaces. We are we're right at time, so um, I think we'll need to end it there. Um, thank you all for um, joining this session. Thanks, Marissa, for a great presentation. And uh, I think our next um, concurrent session begins at 1140. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Marissa.